Hello and welcome to Data Research Labs. For today's advanced Excel Quick Trainer, we're going to discuss the solver feature. The target audience is students or those working in the science or engineering fields. For fast reviewing, put your play speed on 2x and or jump to the chapters of interest in the timeline below. First up, what is Solver? So what is Solver? Well, Solver is basically an advanced goal seek. Unlike goal seek, which is one input, Solver can have many inputs. I have three in the example over here to the right, but you could have even more. Solver will find one output, just like goal seek, our green cell down there. Solver can be given complex search criteria. For the target cell, you can look for a maximum value, look for a minimum value, or like goal seek, look for a specific value. You can also change the variables, inputs. You can have, in this case, I have uh, three inputs, the three yellow that we saw on the last slide, but you could have a whole range of four, five, 10, 15 inputs. And you can have a bunch of rules around those inputs, maximum value, minimum value, as it's iterating through and trying out different combinations of those numbers you can make it follow these rules. And then there's a checkbox too for make sure it's greater than zero. You can use an algorithm of your choice. There's at least three different solver algorithms. And you can have custom algorithm configurations, the options button here. And we'll look at all these different options in upcoming slides. Next up, comparing solver to goal seek. So using goal seek as a baseline to compare against solver, goal seek has one input, goal seek has one output. Goal seek has one target value. Notice a pattern there, one, one, one. Goal seek has one solver algorithm, goal seek. And the algorithm iterates on one input, starting through seed data and formulas, until it finds the answer meeting the one criteria. Solver is more advanced. Solver has multiple inputs, not just one. Solver does have one output, that's the same. But Solver also has multiple input parameter rules, something that GoalSeq doesn't have at all. So you can set up a minimum or maximum value or whatever rules you want to use. Solver also has multiple algorithms, uh, GRG nonlinear, that's the default, simplex LP, and evolutionary. And the algorithm iterates on multiple inputs, starting with your seed data and formulas until it finds an answer meeting all the criteria. When comparing goal seek versus solver, we can do so by list. So goal seek has one input, but solver has multiple inputs. They're both the same regarding the number of outputs, one, but goal seek has a single target value, whereas solver has multiple input parameter rules. Goal seek has one solver algorithm, goal seek, but solver has multiple solver algorithms. And finally, the goal seek algorithm iterates on one input, whereas Solver iterates on multiple inputs, and Goal Seek goes until it finds the one answer that you tell it to find, whereas Solver goes until it finds an answer that meets all of the criteria, rather than the answer that meets the one criteria. So comparing Goal Seek versus Solver by dialog box. On the left is Goal Seek, on the right is Solver. They both have one two cell, target cell, dependent variable, you will. And that is what you're trying to change the value to. The goal seek on the left has one two value. You're trying to change cell E16 to the value of 600. But solver is a bit fancier. It has three possible outcome states. You can tell solver to set that objective or target cell to a maximum value, to a minimum value, or like goal seek to a specific value of 600. Three possible states, whereas goal seek has one. Goal seek has an input by changing cell. Solver has more than one. Solver has as many as you want. In this case, I have three. I have a range of two, and then I tack on a disjointed cell. And solver also has constraints and rules that can be applied to the input cells, boundaries to make sure that as it iterates different inputs, it doesn't go too high or too low. And finally, comparing goal seek versus solver, by using a base sheet example. So in this example, it's the same calculation. One is goal seek, one is solver, but they're both looking at total revenue, total cost, net income. They both have all the same widget unit prices, etc. The difference is that goal seek can have one input, 
but we can have three inputs or even more if we want for the solver examples. The solver example is a lot more flexible in finding a solution if you want to be and if you want to set establish rules. But they both have a single output, the net income value here. So goal seek, you would tell it to find a specific value by changing this input. Solver, you would say, find this value by changing these three inputs with some rules. Next up, how to activate Solver. So how do we activate Solver? Well, first you check whether it's already installed. So you go to the data menu item and the submenu analyze and the button Solver. And if that button exists here, then Solver is already activated. But if Solver does not exist, go on to the next steps. So the steps to activate, you go to the menu file and then the options menu and then the add-ins and then you click on the go button. And then you check the solver add-on and click OK. Now we need to confirm that solver is activated. Once again, look at the menu data and the submenu analyze and make sure that the button solver exists. Next up, how to use solver. So how do you use solver? Well, you start with a worksheet and some formulas. So there has to be one or more inputs that are values because Solver is going to iterate on those values and change and try different uh, values and go up and down. So my example to the right, the yellow values are the inputs. There has to be one output. It has to be a formula, and it's green in my example. And then there can be lots of other formulas. Think of this spreadsheet as a black box engine with a lot of stuff going on. It starts with the yellow values that it's going to iterate. It runs through a bunch of formulas and black box stuff and ultimately ends up in this green single output formula. And that's the one that we're going to try and find a maximum or a minimum or a specific value on by iterating through various combinations of these values. Next, we set up the model and solve. So we click the menu data, analyze, solver, and up comes the dialog you see to the right. And then we select our output cell from the base worksheet. That's our dependent variable, our DV. There can only be one cell. can't be a range. And it should be a formula. Then we select our target value that we want to look at in the output cell, or our type. We're going to target for a maximum value, or we're going to target for a minimum value, or we're going to target for an exact value. And then we're going to select the input cells. These are independent variables, or IVs. There can be multiple cells. The cells can be disjointed or separated with commas. Uh, use the picker button here, this uh, little up arrow. And you can or use the uh, shift key to select adjacent cells, or you can use the control key to select non-adjacent cells or select the cells one at a time. But in the end, you'll end up with a range of cells that are your input values. Next, we assign rules. We apply those to the independent variables, the inputs, if you will. The independent variables must have upper and lower thresholds or bounds. Uh, you can check this checkbox down here to make sure they're all non-negative, they're zero or greater, or you can apply them specifically. It's okay to compare one independent variable to another in the rules. The rules can be as complex as necessary by using functions in the IV cell formulas, and you can save time with that checkbox that I just mentioned for the non-negative down at the bottom there. Next, you select the model. There's LP simplex for linear problems. There's the GRG nonlinear, that's the default for smooth or nonlinear problems. And then there's evolutionary approach that's also non-smooth. And when all that's selected, then you next click solve. And then you review and interpret the results. So the independent variable inputs that were necessary to arrive at the dependent variable which I believe I said go for the maximum and set some boundaries, and it did that. It went all the way up to a million dollar maximum, and it hit the widget price. I had thresholds for that, etc. Note the model options button. Uh, you would set that up before you click solve, but I didn't. I just used the defaults. If you do click that options button, a separate dialog comes up, and it looks something like that. It uh, has control it controls the solving limits max time number of iterations etc and it also control controls the constraints convergence and population and a bunch of other settings so you can look at those when you run this yourself next up example number one from business a simple revenue cost income model 
So here we are demoing example number one, taken from the business with a simple revenue cost income model. We have all our data set up. So we're gonna start with data and analyze and solver. And with solver, we wanna set our objective that is going to be Oh, I have my old solver stuff, so I got to clear all this out. Reset all. Boom. Reset all solver. Yes, there, that wiped everything out. So we want to set our objective cell down here, and we want to set that equal to the maximum. Find the maximum value. What are we going to change? All the yellow cells. We want to change the widget price. Hold the control key down. Do the number of widgets sold and the cost per widget. So price that we sell it, the cost that we build it, and the number of widgets sold. Vary all those in any combination to find the maximum value. And let's see. And we want to set some rules. Let's add some rules in. And let's set the widget unit price up here. Let's say that that can't be more than $13. For whatever reason, we don't want to set the price beyond $13. Maybe we know that people won't buy it beyond $13. So that's great. So we have that price. And let's add another one that says that the unit price should always be greater than or equal to the cost. You don't want to sell it below cost. So we will do that. And what else? The number of widgets. Let's make the number of widgets that we sell be greater than 100. Why even bother if you're not going to sell 100 widgets? And we'll add another one that says the number of widgets sold, let's just say that we, we can't sell more than 10,000. For whatever reason, our store doesn't have enough space, whatever. There's some reason we can't sell more than 10,000 of them. And our cost per widget. Let's make our cost per widget. We can never squeeze it less than $3. But we also don't want our cost per widget to ever exceed eight dollars we don't want to make it so fancy it exceeds eight dollars so however fancy we build it it has to be between three and eight so there we go that is all of our rules so we have basically six values we have an upper and a lower bound on each of the input cells and we don't have to check this but whatever because we have lower bounds i'm going to leave it checked and we'll just leave the default grg nonlinear, and let's click solve and boom, I didn't get any red. Solver did find a solution. I could click OK and save it, or I could click Cancel, and it'll all revert back. But before I do either, let's look and see. So it went to the maximum that I set, $13, and it went to the maximum, $10,000 10, for the dynamic input, and it went to the minimum, $3 per widget. <laughs> well, of course, it makes sense. You want to maximize revenue, get the highest price I allowed, get the highest number of widgets I allowed. You want to minimize cost, take the lowest cost. That's It just quickly found a solution and, and posted it in and run the numbers and we get $100,000. Next up, example number two from chemistry, Beer's Law, using spectra to predict concentration. So for example number two, we're going to use Beer's Law, using spectra to predict concentration. Now, my sister's a chemistry professor. She set this up for her lab and her students. I don't understand chemistry that well. It's been 30 plus years since I've taken it. And I never took this stuff, so I don't understand it, but I'm going to walk through the example from her and then show you how to solve that in Excel. And I'm going to actually include this Excel spreadsheet with all the details out on my GitHub account, and I'll put a link to it at the bottom of the YouTube video. That way you can go download it and look at everything in there, all the equations and formulas and how it's set up. But let's get started. Let's, let's uh, level set for this example before we do a demo. We're going to start with a pure spectrum of observations, that's our baseline of dichromate. So there's a bunch of wavelengths, 300 to whatever, 400, incrementing by one nanometer at a time, and then we're gonna measure the absorbance. And then we're gonna do the same thing with a second pure spectrum of permanganate. So we have two different pure spectrums, our baselines, if you will. And then we're gonna add in a third set of observations where we mix these two at different concentrations and then take measurements or uh, observed spectrum of the mixed chemicals. And then 
We're going to set up formulas for Beer's Law. We're going to add this baseline spectrum plus this baseline spectrum, and we should get this baseline spectrum. That's our expected. Add these two together is our expected, and we have an actual which is the true measurements we took, and we're going to compare our expected from the formulas to our actual and see what the rate of errors is. That's basically what we're doing at a high level. And after we set up all that, those formulas, then we'll run solver and solve for it. So that is what the demo is going to be. So example number two is Beer's Law, and we walked through this in the slides. I'll do it again here. We have this blue section, which is our pure spectrum for the first chemical, dichromate, and this is a baseline, of, and we're going to look at 300 to 600 is that nanometers. So it's, look, it's taking measurements one increment at a time, one nanometer at a time, and measuring the absorbance of those wavelengths all the way down to 600. And then we're going to do the same thing with the pure spectrum for the second solution per manganate. So two baselines. And then this is the same thing yet again, 300 to 600 nanometers, measuring the absorbance. But this is measuring the absorbance after we mix the two at given concentrations. And then what we're going to do is in theory, if you add these, you should get this value, or close proximity to it. And so, if we hadn't taken the measurements, we could just add the two up and have an expected value. But because we also have an actual value, hey, now we can compare our sum of these two, our expected versus our actual. And then we can see how accurate our equation is. And again, I don't understand all the details of this, but basically you run through all these calculations, summing up the, two, the mixed spectrum, you calculate it, and then here's the mix, okay, here, look at it this way. This plus this should equal that. So you subtract the actual from the expected, which is the sum, and you get a difference. So here's the actual where it's adding them and it's also doing some multiplication. And then it's subtracting the observed and that gets you a kind of an error, if you will, a delta, expected versus actual. And then all 600 of these, 305, I guess, from 300 to 600. All 300 of those measurements, you take the sum of squared differences. So think of this as an error. And so that's what we're looking at. So if we have all these equations set up, we're going to use solver to minimize the error here, try and find the smallest error possible by randomly running through different combinations of these two coefficients. And these two coefficients are used, let's see, J and K, J4, K4, J4, K4. So when we're calculating the mixed spectrum, we're actually taking this value and not just simply summing this value, but we're taking this value, multiplying it by a constant that's, or a coefficient that represents that given solution. So absorbance at a given wavelength times the coefficient plus absorbance of the other solution at a given coefficient. So anyway, that's what we're doing in a nutshell is minimize this value, our target value, our two value, by figuring out the best input coefficients that drive this formula, and then which in turn drives the error, which in turn ends in the target cell. So that's what we're doing. And let's go ahead and jump in and get started. So here we go data and analyze and solver. And I have some stuff from the last example, so let's reset all of that. Yep. And what is our objective? Well, our objective is to minimize the sum of squared differences, the error, the overall error across all those 305 measurements. So that is our target, and we want to minimize that. And we want to do so by changing, let's see, click in here. We're going to change these two coefficient cells. So I use a control key and just tack both of those in. And for this particular equation, I already ran it, so I know I don't need to put any constraints in. It's not going to error. It's not going to get divided by zero. It's not going to go negative. I don't need to put any in, so I won't. And I'm going to leave it the default 
GRG nonlinear. If it runs too long or has a problem, then maybe I'll switch to uh, evolutionary. But let's just go ahead and give it a whirl and click solve. It runs. Solver converged to the current solution. Nice. And 0.49287. Yep. I know from running it before and talking with my sister that indeed these are the correct values. And finally, example number three, an electrical engineering problem, the Kirchhoff circuit theory. So for example number three, we're going to take a page from electrical engineering and tackle Kirchhoff circuit theory. Uh, my son was trying to work on a circuit problem for his electrical engineering class. It was a task in MATLAB. I don't know MATLAB. I don't know electrical engineering. But I do know Excel Solver, so I pitched in to help. That would be fun. So he got it all solved and figured out. And then for me, he recreated the test circuit that you see over there on the right. He just hand sketched it out real quick and I included it here. So given an arbitrary circuit, Kirchhoff's theory says that in must equal out. So my son drew up that I, given this circuit, I1 plus I2 has to equal I3. That's the different components. He went through the different resistors and the voltage and everything and said I1 equals this component, I2 equals this component, and I3 equals this component on the right side of the equal sign. So he figured all that out for me. And then he just arbitrarily came up with some given voltages and resistance starting point. And then we set up the formulas in Excel. There's your I1, there's your I1, there's all that. This is just text. There's the actual formula where it's going to pull the values for V1, 9, V2, 2, R1, the 20, the VX down here that's going to substitute in. So there's the formulas. So we have our inputs, we have our target output, then we have all the formulas. And so we're going to iterate through all kinds of combinations of these inputs to arrive at, I think I set it at 9 volts is what I want to find out. I can't remember. We'll see when we do the demo. But anyway, we have all our formulas set up based on the circuit. And then we iterate on that, set up solver and iterate on that until we find a solution. And yes, 9 volts. So I wanted this to iterate and change the resistors until it arrived at a value of 9 volts. So let's get started. Data, analyze, solver. And we will reset all the values from the prior example. There we go. All zeroed out. So what is our objective? Well, we want to set the VX voltage and we want to set that to a value of 9 volts, 9 volt battery. And how do we want to do that? Well, we want to change all of these resistors. Whichever ones it needs to change, go ahead and change them. And probably should set up some rules. I threw them out here. Here's the original values. Here's the minimum I want it to go, and then there's the given. So as far as the constraints go, let's just go ahead and add them in really quickly. Let's say that that cell has to be greater than or equal to that minimum value. See how we, can, we don't have to hard code a one in there. We can actually have it reference a cell. One cell, reference another cell. And we're going to do that over and over and over. But i got to get that right and have the right direction. And the third greater than or equal to one, and then we'll add another one, this guy, greater than or equal to that value, and one more. Oops, well, whatever. Greater than, equal to that value, and okay, and there we go. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. yep. And let's see, each resistor, yep. Well, not needed. We have this checkbox. I don't need the checkbox because they're all greater than or equal to zero because I already have the one in there. But I'll leave the checkbox anyway. And I'll leave the default GRG nonlinear and I will click solve. And it ran. It said it found a solution. There's no big red exclamation or anything. I look down here in my target cell. It is indeed nine. That's what I told it to solve for. And I'll look at that. Interesting. I run it at different times and I get different resistor values. So if I start these at different, anyway. So four and five apparently don't matter on the circuit, so they always just stay the same. But one, two, and three, R1, R2, R3, they matter. And so it found that if it had 10 ohms, 10 ohms, and 1.065 ohms, 
I could arrive at nine volts. So pretty neat. And you can play around. I'm going to hit cancel, go back to the original. You can play around with all these values and all the different rules, minimums and maximums. What I have, I had 10, 10, and 1. What if I do 2 here and I go back to data and analyze and solver and I solve it again? So before it was 1 point something, I can't remember exactly what, and these were 10 point, 10 point. Now when I say I want you to be 2 or greater, well, it went to the smallest value, 2, and then these are much smaller. So you can see how you can play around with all these, the rules, the minimums here, and I, the minimums go into the rules, and then the calculations come out different. So solver is really neat for doing what if, complex what if scenarios. Thank you for watching, and please, if you found this video helpful, click like, or even better, click subscribe to increase this channel's reach.